You're listening to SM Media, the home of exclusive West of Scotland Football League content. Hi folks and welcome to the final SM Media West of Scotland football show of the season. I'm Scott McPike, it's an absolute pleasure to be your host as always. And to mark the end of the season, we are having a champion special on the show. It is a pleasure to welcome two title winning managers this season. First of all, it's a pleasure to welcome the, the Premier Division winning manager, the manager of Beef Juniors, the one and only Chris Train. Chris, welcome to the show, it's a pleasure to have you on. Cheers Scott, thanks for having us. It's an absolute pleasure. And we're also joined by the third division title winning manager. It is a pleasure to welcome onto the show, John Hughes. John, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks, uh, Scott. Appreciate it. I think yeah, it's a pleasure to have you both on. We're looking forward to this. We're going to obviously review the the kind of five leagues as a whole, chat at both sides and your your title winning journeys as a whole. Strainy, obviously your season had finished a wee bit earlier than the other leagues, but how good has this season been for yourselves? Obviously, be the one in the league. We'll, we'll kind of start it. We'll kind of start for the the beginning, taking the job in the summer. What was the kind of what was it about B that stood out? I I know that obviously kind of this last season you had a, a difficult time, but coming into a, a job like B, what was it that stood out about the B job for you? Um, when I left Cowan, um, I, I I was adamant probably that I was going to have a wee bit of time out, um. And the B job came up and the guys spoke to me and I, initially I thought, you know, looking at the league position and stuff, you're thinking, oh, it might be, you know, a bit of a struggle and um, you think to yourself, is it the right time just to go back in? But spoke to the committee, great bunch of guys um, uh, and, and I just thought, do you know what, I'm just going to go in and make the best of it. Um, I had seen them obviously play against them a couple of times and knew there were some good players there. Um, but... Uh, I needed the right kind of background, uh, a, a backroom team, and I got that um, with the guys that obviously I'd played with, and Kevin McDonald came in, and Sean Dillon, um, Paul McDougall, and um, Brian Whelan, they came in. And once I had them in the background set up, I felt confident that we could win and do a good job, and that was kind of the main reason as to why I took it. I knew that the team behind me would be, you know, fully committed, and, and we could kick it on. So, fortunately, we did that. Obviously, signed some good players to, to complement the players that were there already. And and really, the, the team were probably just short a wee bit of confidence, Scott, at that point in time. They managed to stay up and um, we, we kind of really went from strength to strength as the season grew. And we're on a journey. I mean, it's a very, very young squad. Um, and, and I think we're obviously ahead of the curve, ahead of where we should be at this point in time, given what we've achieved. Um, but the plan is always to keep improving and keep improving the players and um, they gave me a new lease of life. Sometimes, you know, when you've been somewhere for a period of time, you stagnate. I'd been at Cowinning for eight and a half years and uh, had a long period in the top division with them. Um, but we were hitting a kind of glass ceiling at Cowinning. Um And for what want of a better word, you know, we've went on to be and it's just worked. It's been, there's, there's been synergies all over the place in terms of how the boys are driven and how I want to drive them and kick them on to do as well as they can do. But it's, you know, you asked me what attracted me to the job. Be there for success over the last, you know, 10, 15 years. They're a well-run football club. Um, it's not an accident that they, they do these things. They've had it all right. They had a couple of bumpy years there, but everybody can have that. And I just think when I, when I spoke to the committee and the guys involved, that they've got a passion for the football club and they wanted it to kick on. And um, fortunately, we've done that. And, it's been a great season for us. Absolutely, yeah. And John, I can a different situation as well. Obviously, getting into Vela Clyde, Colin had obviously had done really well in the time he was there last season before he got the Athlete job. Like, I can a similar question to yourself. What was it about Vela Clyde that attracted you? And was it was it a kind of good situation to get into him? And the side were doing really well. Obviously, they had a good run in the the cup as well. How did you kind of feel about when you when the Vela of Clyde job come up? It was, it was, it was a bit of a strange one. I was actually out taking one of my close friends' uh, yeah. team session that night, and I, I get into the car after it, and there was two missed calls and a, a text message for the chairman, John Morrison. I've got good 
uh, relationships with a lot of the committee, um, or, or all of the committee at Vela Clyde, um, having been there before um, for a period of about 18 months, uh, just before COVID when I left to go to East Kilbride. Um, and it was, it was I'd basically got across the Erskine Bridge on the way back from, from Mount Blow and I'd, I had accepted the role. Obviously, Colin uh, and, and Derek had been in. I don't know them personally, as I'd, I'd said uh, another week. I don't know them personally, but they'd, they'd done a, a really good job. They'd some good cup runs, I think. I took over and they were sitting fifth mm. in the league. I think we'd five games in hand. Um, but I, the good thing going in was I knew about 80% of the players. I'd either coached or managed them at the Vale before or with the the, the amateur select team that I, I was in yeah. charge with for, for 18 months. So... I knew a lot of them. I either managed against them, managed them. So that was um, a good scenario. It was probably only, I don't know, 21, 22 players, probably about four of them that I didn't really know. Um, so it, it was it was, it was, was a strange situation to get in, but um, I went in at a good point. Um, there was, you know, 18 games left in the league. Um, the the players, I think I listened to your, your show the other week and Jamie was on, and I think he made a good point, you know, Sometimes you go in with a team aren't doing well and they get the, the, the new manager bounce. Going in when the team's doing, you know, pretty decent um, can have its own challenges because the players, you know, some of them are sitting there going, you know, the managers just left us and, you know, some were like, well, you know, who's this guy coming in? All that kind of stuff. But I think I knew in that first day away to Les Mihago, the way we played and um, the reaction I got from them. I mean, it was fairly convincing that day. Um, away to Les Mahego. Um and then I think I pretty knew pretty knew after about another week or so that we were going to be definitely challenging um, for the title I def- or for, for promotion at least anyway Yeah I think that's that's absolutely fair and Chris like I think a lot of a lot of things have been t- we, sp- we spoke about it every week about the, the kind of standard all the leagues but obviously the Premier Division the big thing, obviously, was getting a run together. And there was a, a time in the, the league you went on a run where you were unbeaten. I think it was something like 19 games. That's a massive advantage. And obviously, like, how how hard was it to maintain, maintain that consistency? And when did it become a kind of... I know, obviously, it never be, it's no done until it's done. But when did you get the feeling during that run you could think, we could actually win this? Um, we, signed, we signed three boys just to... November, December time, just before Christmas, um, we felt there was areas of the squad that we needed to just beefen up and improve. And we signed um, Owen Strott and goals. And Owen was absolutely sensational from when he came in. Um, um, we also get Deck Hughes, uh, and and he, you know, gave us real competition in the middle of the park. And and we felt we were doing well. And then we signed Scott Roth. And again, when you sign players, you target players that you think can improve your team, but the boys came in and the way they gelled, you know, after a, after a period of a couple of weeks, you're thinking there's strength and depth in the squad here. You know, all we need to do is put ourselves um, in a good position and, and see where it takes us. Could, and I'll be honest with you, around November time, we were just below, I think Darvel were on a, a really strong unbeaten run at that period in time as well. Um, and we were just below the kind of top two or three. And I thought, you know, we've got some favourable fixtures at home just after... Uh, New Year, and and we went on that run from no, well it was I think after the beat is in November and we didn't get beat again until the May, which was a phenomenal run or maybe end of April probably but just we lost the game against Troon. But the, when you were in, as you say when you're on a run you you look at it and you go oh, that fixture looks a tricky one that fixture looks a tricky one. We went to Larg and we won three one and there was a bit of debacle after the game at Larg and um. We, we certainly deserve to win. And Largs are a very, very tough venue, and we certainly deserve to win that day. Um, and then we went to... Um, we went to Troon in a midweek game, and we had won well on the Saturday. It was a difficult game. We went to Troon, and Troon really kind of gave us a tough, tough time at that night. We won 1-0, and we really dug it out. And at that point in time, I'm thinking to myself, Darvo probably at that point were being distracted a wee bit with the Scottish Cup run that they were on. And if we keep ourselves, you know, below the below the radar here and just take care of ourselves, win the games, we never know where it's going to take us. And that just transpired, that became a mantra, you know, keep winning, don't slip up in any games. And then by the time we were supposed to, by the time we hit the front, um, teams then had tricky fixtures with each other. And as you've seen in the league, you know, 
week to week, you've only, you know, I think we were the only team that put a, a, a win and run together. We won nine games in the bounce, then we drew against coming up with 10 men when we should have won that day as well. We scored a, a last minute equaliser. So we were unbeaten in 16 games. And that period of time, there was games where we won fortuitously. Um, we won we won up at um, Glen Afton. We weren't fluid at all and we won 2 1. Difficult, difficult place to go and win. Got a horrible record there as a player and a manager. But when you're winning games, the momentum builds and, and you hear people saying, you know, confidence is high. The guys just went in a fantastic run and the players get better and better. They get more confident with each other. They get more confident in the systems that we played, more confident, you know, in one another's ability. And when you're on that winning run, you know, you know what that brotherhood's like. You want to throw bodies on the line and, and they want to do as well as they can for each other. And then it, it just started getting closer and closer. When we beat Darville at home, I think we went five points clear of Darville and we beat them at home. And I thought at that point in time it would be very difficult for anybody to catch us, but very reticent to say. I think Scott McHard tried to nail me after the game and say, you're our definite favourites for the league. And whilst you think that might be in the back of your mind, you're very reticent to say that because these things can go against you very, very quickly. But the momentum that we had and the, the games that other teams had, that Oaken Lake obviously had hundreds of fixtures to try and fit in, and that's never an easy thing to do. But we were never mathematically ahead. All those teams had games in hand and stuff like that. We all can like and stuff. But when we went up there and we beat them 2-1 at their place, that was kind of, it was game over for there, for everybody else. So delighted with the consistency that the boys showed. And and it's all doing to hard work. I mean, we were not by any manner of means, you know, I hear people talking about um, possession and patterns of play, rotations, you know, loads of buzzwords and, yeah, we can all we can all speak about it and we can all do it. The thing that <laughs> the thing that got our team over the line was their endeavour, their hard work, their determination, fundamentals that you, you breed into the boys, but I didn't need to breed it into them. They, you know, they have them, they've got strength of character and everything that we speak about to them is managing their behaviours and I don't really need to manage their behaviours, they manage them themselves. Great bunch of boys and as I say, don't think anybody else put that run together, maybe Darvo at the start of the season. But we hung on to their coattails and then when we got in front, it was just keep it going. And, and fortunately for us, we, we won the league. Yeah, absolutely. And John, kind of similar to similar as well, obviously, like build it, like different to, to maybe Bede as well. Like you were sat in fifth when you went in, but you've obviously had the games to make up. Like to get that run on the board, and I think Villa Clyde went on a real good run as well. I don't think Villa Clyde lost a game for a, a long, long time. And how, how good is that to kind of build? And I, I think probably the game that kind of set it was obviously that one at Adrossen towards the, the middle of May, maybe a few weeks ago. The league was kind of probably won technically, but it was just to get that win. And Adrossen were really good as well. They were scoring a lot of goals. What's the kind of big moments like? Can you pinpoint a kind of moment in the in the run where you thought this was at, kind of similar to, to where I asked Chris, like moments, big moments where you felt this, this league is in our hands. When did that kind of become reality for you? I think you're probably right um, in terms of the addressing game. That that was that was the big game because we got ourselves into a decent position uh, on the Wednesday prior to that by right? going a point clear of them with a game in hand. Um, and in reality, you know, you're you're going there wanting to win, but I'm thinking, you know, if we can get a point here, when we're game in hand on Wednesday, you know, we're, we're we're still four points clear. I think as Chris says there, you know, if you've got some really strong characters in the dressing room. Um, who have been over this kind of course before. Um, you know, you've got guys like Steve McDavid, Thomas Sinclair, Robbie Peebles, Lee Morrison, guys who are kind of seasoned, you know, what you call as ex-juniors, you know, been around the block, you know, and very strong characters in that dressing room. You're 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 managing them, but they're all they're, they're managing themselves at points. And I think when you looked at it, um, you know, the, the I think the top four of the top, sorry, of the top five. We beat the top four uh, in, in the running. So we beat, we went to Drossen and to be honest, we were absolutely excellent that day. We were 2 0 up after 18 minutes. We could have been 4 0 up. Um, we were really, I mean, they, they admitted that after the game, we were, we were excellent. Uh, we even went down to 10 men with half an hour to go, 25 minutes to go. Went 3 1 up. We actually got stronger almost, uh, get into the, the latter stages of the game, won that, and then we beat Lanark. Um, on the Wednesday night, and that got his promotion. Um, so I, th I think 
you know, I, I, I probably thought, you know, a couple of weeks before that, you know, we're, we're definitely going to get promotion. We, we, I definitely thought that. Never told the players that, but I thought deep down um, we would get promotion. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the carrot was winning the league. And I, and I think once we, we get by the Ardrossing game, I mean, we, we absolutely, you know, I think the next four games we were scoring six, seven, another six type thing, you know. So we kind of sprinted over the line at the end um, to, to win the league. It wasn't there for we were, you know, struggling to go over it. Um, and I think the league table, from my experience of just being in there for half a season, is that the actual league table, the top seven teams, I would say, based on my experience of seeing them, were probably in that order. Definitely in that order, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's obviously both both managers, you we'll ask you kind of this question, you both had kind of top goal scorers who were brilliant, obviously be uh, bead with Josh and Vela Clyde with Thomas, but Chris, I want to come to you first. I'm just looking at B's statistics for their goals. Obviously, Josh Fowler at 29 goals, a remarkable uh, return. But Andy Monk with 17, Carlo with 13, Conor McGlinchey with 12, Paul Fry's with 10. There was just this brilliant balance. And I'm sure you'll agree with, obviously, a young prop like Sir Josh Fowler, Daniel O'Neill, Scott Ruff coming in. But you also had a lot of good experience with Carlo, Conor McGlinchey, Paul Fry's. The balance was just tremendous with that B side this season, I thought. Yeah. Um... Josh will not thank you for saying 29 goals because he's claiming 32 goals somewhere. <laughs> um, the the goal the, the goal scoring, my, it's not my teams, but my kind of philosophy, if, if you can have that, is you want to be on the front foot, you want to be playing attacking football, yeah. and you create the chances. Um, Josh and Andy, you know, married off pretty well together, hit it off well. Um, Carlo's got that wee bit of magic within games where he can open teams up in tight games. You know, you see, you see, you've probably all seen the goal he scored against um, Darvo to kind of clinch that game. Um, the front three had a lovely balance and a lovely think about them. But the, the thing that struck me was the, the work rate from them, it starts, you know, it's, it's, it's craft and it's probably a wee bit, um, how would I say this? It's cliche to say that your front three are your you know, your starting line in terms of your defence, but they did, they worked their backsides off, put pressure on teams. Um, and we kind of had a wee tweaky formation uh, and it worked for us. We went, you know, we were playing probably with two up top, we went to three and it really worked. The balance was good. And as you say, we've got good experience in the team as well, but the, the real part of it was, you know, mentioning the same guys, but Owen came in. If we did Owen at the start of the season, I think we had seven different goalkeepers at the start of the season. Um, we were horrendously, horrendous time with injuries um, to goalkeepers and then, you know, a couple come in just to fill a couple of games here and a couple of games there that could help us out and we dropped a lot of points in that period, you know, people forget that, that we were very inconsistent at that period in the time and a lot of that was the, the, the goalkeeper um, situation changing every week, vital, vital kind of place for him and then as I say, Scott come in for Muir Kirk and him and Danny had it off right away. Yeah. Um and and again, you're mentioning experience, but that that you know, the two centre halves, they're both 21, 22 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, goalkeepers 24. You know, you've got Steg Noble and um Connor at either side of them who you know help help the guys at the back. But fundamentally it's a very, very young team. Mm-hmm. Um and, and that that's great for me because there's loads of potential within the team, but I that there's no magic formula, Scott, in football. You know, you're saying it looked good from a balance point of view. The thing that struck me was our fitness. Um, it was incredible. And we pushed them hard right through the season. It was a period in time where we, we kind of eased off training because we, we trained really, really hard in pre-season. And we were playing a lot of cup games and stuff like that at the start. And then we thought, you know, maybe being a wee bit hard on them in terms of training, the recovery wasn't ideal. Um, and we actually fell off the edge of a cliff for a few weeks and we needed to up training again and when we up the training again the boys just kicked on and responded and that's testament to them and their you know their commitment and their endeavour that they wanted to train as hard as they did throughout the season and it, it paid dividends because I, I, I genuinely didn't see a team that was fitter than us over the, the, the course of the season. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And John yourself obviously we with Bela Clyde, Thomas Sinclair stands out with thirty nine goals, but Paul Don who's in there with twenty three and there is a kind of match. You've got uh, uh, Dylan McGuigan, Dylan Henry, John McHugh, 
we mentioned about Stephen Medev. I wanted to get a touch on Stephen. Obviously, his his experience, obviously coming from from where he came from, obviously being at kind of Cobble Park from Chapel, you'll know him well. How big was that kind of experience with kind of Stephen and Thomas in particular? Because they they were kind of the driving forces behind that team. I thought. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I mean, I, I always spoke about the collective um, unit in terms of how how the the whole squad uh, contributed throughout the time. Not just be, you know before I was in, and then. Obviously, since I went in, but I mean, I've known Sinky for a number of years. I know um, McDee for a number of years. Um, both, you know, strong characters. When you look at the goals, I think it was 130 goals in the league. This, you know, we scored. Sinky's got like 35 in the league. Pablo 23. Um, but I mean, the whole backbone. If you look at the backbone of the team, you know, Sinky, Pablo up front. You've got McDee uh, sitting in the middle of it. You know, you've got Robbie Peebles. You know, at, at centre back sweeper. Um, very, very strong characters. So all, I suppose they're all good in, in the areas of the pitch. You know, you've got that voice for each each particular area. But no, they were they were great. Um, and you can see in the, the Player of the Year, um, Steve McDevitt won that, and and and, and Tom Sinclair won the Players Player, and obviously the top goal scorer. So they, they were awarded, you know, in terms of their their, their own um, awards, and obviously they won the West. Um, uh, Thomas Sinclair won the West of Scotland third division player of the year as as well. So a great, you know, great personal accolades for them uh, in, in terms of that. But for me, it was the collective. And you look, you know, there's goals all across that that team, especially for, you know Dylan McGuigan, John McHugh, you know, popping up Kevin Turner, also another experienced uh, striker who's played senior as well. So um, again, Kevin probably playing most from the bench for me, um, although. Um, he did play probably two or three games in a row there when when uh, Paul was away on holiday, etc. So when we lost Paul for a couple of games uh, at that end of the season spell and, and Kevin came in and um, certainly uh, did the job for us. Really, I, I don't know how to kind of phrase this question to you, but I, I noticed when you were your end of season holiday, you, you put a comment up about kind of who's going to... It was something, I can't remember it word, I'm paraphrasing, but you said something a bit like, when people think we're going to slap up, like there was, there were, you could always see that chat was was on social media. That like there was a lot of people thinking like the big kind of side of Darvel would eventually catch and things like that. Like how do you kind of convey that to the dressing room just to forget the noise because it, it maybe is different. You you've been in the game a long time, but that does the impact of that kind of affect us a dressing room? Do you think or was it? Um, I wasn't aware that they actually t shirt things. I think somebody kind of. Said an interview and they were going well or something like that for one of the teams. I, I, I honestly, it, it actually kind of these things bug me. You know, right. it, it's again, I don't want to be harsh on the boys or anything like that, but it's not for me. It's just I'm a wee bit more old school than that now. I probably was like it as a player, mm -hmm. but when you're a manager, your sole focus is on making sure everybody's you know tickety boo and we're doing the right things, and you don't want to antagonise people or anything like that. Certainly, um, but again. Players are going to have their moment in the sun, but it was obviously evident for them that they were talking about these things. You know, people maybe talking about them behind the scenes or whatever else. Their sole focus every week was to go out there and win three points and see where it took us. And it's still the, the same. As I said at the start, we're probably ahead of the curve in terms of where we we thought we'd be in in, in the process. But our you know management and backroom team philosophy is to improve. Every week, regardless of, and it's, again, it's cliched, but regardless of where it takes us, we've got the results, and sometimes the same momentum builds up and you get fortuitous results and whatever else, but it's to improve their mentality, it's to improve their physical abilities, it's to improve their technical abilities, to improve their tactical abilities, and if we get better and better, then there's some boys in there that are really, really good footballers, and the, the message for me all the time is concentrate on your football. And and they did that. They you know they they let their hair down at the end of the season. You know we all went away a, a trip which was absolutely brilliant. I think there's, there was nineteen in the squad, and I think two couldn't make it. So the, the togetherness was there. Um, I've not been involved. You know I've been involved in good teams that have won leagues and such like. I've never been involved with a bunch of boys who were a good bunch of characters mm -hmm. and and married in together. And there's people behind the scenes. You know. Blair Rossett's first season in, in junior football, he's running about calling Nicky Docherty Uncle Nicky. Now, Nicky didn't play anywhere near as much as he liked, but, you know, they, they look after each other, they had each other's back, and that was evident whilst they were on holiday, it's evident in life. They go out together, you know, I try to keep myself away from them as much as I can because they bust my chops while they're, 
you know, there. But um, from a social perspective, they, they they certainly got together. And as I say, we've lost probably five of the guys, six of the guys have left us just for one or another. And now I've got real reservations about bringing people into the group because they are such a tight knit group. But the the difficulty for us will be how we kick on for there and how we make sure that we have the same season again or better. Because we didn't do particularly well in the cups. You know, shots puts out both cups, yeah. which were, you know, they deserved to on the days that they, they, they put us out. Um I'm trying to think, did we go to another cup? West Shots puts at the West, Shots puts at Junior Scottish and Trying to think if there's another uh, the South Challenge Cup. Can't remember who put us out, but we were only very it was large. It was a four three yeah, game large, right, yeah. large four three. So um uh, we want to do better in the cups, we want to do better, you want to improve, but the chemistry and the camaraderie between that group of players is exceptional and as long as they keep their t shirts and their slogans to their tail, then I'm not that bothered. <laughs> John, is that the kind of same for yourself, obviously? Like there's a you can tell there's a togetherness, obviously, seen with the, the title celebrations. But one thing that always catches your eye with Baylor Clyde is the, the support, just the, like their, their excitement when you won the league as well. It'll be similar to Bede as well. But how important was that to have that kind of back? And especially going in, like when you did, when they were on a winning kind of formula, how how important was it to be accepted by the, the dressing room and that kind of, to see that kind of chemistry develop? No, it, it was very important. I think that the first game I went out, the, the the young ultras had this, you know, welcome banner, etc. So it was it was good to see, you know. But I was I was I was joking to the folk, you know, there will be shoes must go the following week type of thing. But um, no, it was um, it was good to see. Um, and they're they're right behind my dugout, so it's like constant noise, you know. I mean, like you can't hear yourself think. So um, no, the support's been great. They've been to away games. Um, they, they travel on, on a bus, you know, they travel on trains, they, they get there somehow. So there's a hearty band, eh, probably about 20 to 30 of them that, that, that go to the away games. There's probably about 40 to 50 of them that were home games. So it definitely adds to the atmosphere. In terms of the players in the group, I mean, a lot of them have been, you know, friends for years through through various things, not just football, and and, and they are close. Um, and folks said we did a blip in a couple of games. One was probably my fault, you know, changing the team by six players and, you know, we, we drew a game and then we, we lost away to Lark Hall. But to be fair, Lark Hall, you know, they finished the season second and, as yeah. I said, they were, for my money, they, they were definitely um, warrant of that second place. So that night, you know, we, we could have got a draw at the end. We we'd certainly played well or a lot better in the second half. But there was a few harsh words said by myself and Chris at half-time and full-time. But to be honest, at full-time, Whilst there was a lot of harsh words amongst them, it was never going to ever come to anything because they know each other, you know, that well. You know, probably five or six of them, seven of them. So, you know, they dealt with it. I dealt with it. And we really never looked back after that, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. And, Spenny, obviously a, a big thing with, with this season's obviously if you, you win the league, obviously the, the chat is around promotion and we've, we've, it's been, we've, we know all about the kind of situation with it. But... Like kind of going forward, how important is it to to win the title to build on it and to to install that kind of confidence going forward? Because obviously the club, I think the club do obviously want to get their SFA. You'll know better than me, but to get that, does this do they kind of use this as a kind of a way to build on it, like the the club as a whole? Because it's a massive achievement when you look at it. Absolutely, I, you know I I think I alluded to it before, Scott. People, I hear people saying, oh, it's like Leicester, it's like whatever, you know, it's a shock where we came for last year or whatever else. He's a very, very good football club. And as I say, he's been successful over the past period of years. Johnny Miller had, you know, two league wins and a Scottish Cup win in a 10-year period. You know, some fantastic players still in and around that with a winning mentality in a football club. And if people think they're going to be a flat, you know, a flash in the pan, then they're going to be mistaken because these boys are hungry, you know, once you experience that, if you've got the right mentality, it, don't get me wrong, it's absolutely very, very difficult to go and win again, but that's the aim for us. Like, There's no thinking, all right, we've, we've done well, we'll rest on our laurels. It, for us, it's about that constant path of improvement. And um, slightly different for um, John, I was in that situation with, you know, with winning where you, you've gone up. You can go up again, that momentum's there for you to kick on. And when you're in that top league, 
it would have been ideal for us to go up and you think, well, what, what kind of damage can you do in the Lone League? But we obviously weren't able to go up. Yeah. But then you look at you look at the teams who are, you know, serial winners in, in Auchinleck, they'll be stinging, you know, they, they didn't have a good season by their standards. It's funny saying that, they're second and won a cup, but, you know, they, they want to improve again. Um, they've been through probably a wee bit of rebuild. And you've got Clyde Bank who'll kick on and want to, you know, improve on the the probably the, the, the foundations that they've put in place for the last five or six years been improving consistently. Um you, you look at um Darvel who again Michael Leaven there's been a bit of upheaval there, but certainly with the financial clout that they have and, and the players that are already signed there, um and the players that I know they're speaking to, because I'm speaking to half of them and all, but um eh, it's 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 going to be a tough league. Added into that, you've got real, you know, teams with ambition coming in like St. Caddox, um, Gap Cairn, you know, teams with financial backing as well that can really go and, you know, make a difference in the league. It's going to be an interesting league. And for us, you know, defending your crown becomes difficult because you've got a target in your back. But that's something that I believe that our players are really welcome. They, you know, they want to improve, they want to drive, they've got that inner determination and mentality that they'll... Um, they'll just keep going and trying to get better. So I'm looking forward to the challenge of that as well. And we're only back, we're back in the 19th. So it's you've got 20 days rest now and it's it's straight back into it. So the good thing is to say we've got a young squad and, and the experience there will help them through. But we need to go again. You need to have that mentality and it, it's it's okay becoming a winner. But it's not a fluke if you do it again. Yeah, it certainly is, isn't as well. John, like obviously next season it's going to be a second division. It's going to be obviously a, another step up. How are you kind of preparing for that as well, building on the title win? And there's going to be a you, there's going to be a lot of good sides in that second division. So how important is to is it to be ready for it? No, definitely, Scott. We're um, probably have been in over the last week or so re-signing um, a number of the players. I think we're probably sitting. Probably with the the ones that we've re-signed and the ones that we are going to be signing um, for next season, we're probably sitting at seventeen. Um, I'm looking at three players that I'm hoping to get a decision on over the next couple of days, um, and that will be me pretty much done. And I think I'll be pretty much happy with that. Obviously, there's going to be a couple of folk coming in during the pre-season to have a look at as well. And as we all know, some players will come in, some you know may go during that period as well. Just it depends on. Who, who becomes available, you know, if some folk aren't really, um, you know, coming into the group. I think as Chris says, we've, we've got a really good group there um, and it's it's easy to say, well, well, we'll keep them. But I think, you know, any manager worth his salt wants to improve on, on what he's got and, and that's what I'm doing in certain areas. It's not a lot, but it's probably, you know, three or four areas that I'm looking to improve on and um, I think I've done that with the four players that I'm, I'm bringing in to add to it. And if I certainly get the two or three, um, that you know, if, if I get two out of three, I'll be delighted. If I get three out of the three, I'll be over the moon. Um, for next season, it will be a tough league. But again, I think you know, from the from the conferences a previous year, you know, the second and third division, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if you know, the teams that go up go up again. As Chris yeah. said, you know, you can get that momentum and, um. You know, it will even itself out over the next probably two or three years at the at, at the second division, third division kind of level. Um, but we're certainly going up there to, you know, to compete to to get promotion. That that's that's our aim. You know, what's the point if you're not? Want to do that? I'm not sitting here saying, that, you know, I don't want to sit, you know, mid table and oh, that's I'm happy with that. And certainly the players that I'm that I have and the players that I'm bringing in, well, I'm, I'm not signing them for that. That's that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. We'll we'll move into kind of talking about the the five leagues. We'll do a kind of end of season review, just kind of talking about them, just a, a wee bit at a time. Premier Division obviously bees bees one, Auckland Lake second, Darvel third. But straight to get into the kind of season as a whole, there's a lot of sides in there that I think just kind of over kind of outperformed. But I think a lot of people thought. I'm looking at likes of Lags, you've got likes of Hurlford as well, Clyde Bank as well again. But there's just a lot of teams really done well this season, just like obviously league position, it was, it was really difficult to to kind of look at just how well, but I look at like, so like Lags finishing 47 points, going after 42 from where they were at one point, there's a, a lot of sides can be proud of this season actually. Yeah, um, you know, there's a, there's a few anomalies in there, um, but again, if you look at the teams that, that are there, 
there's probably a consistency. You don't get this in other leagues, by the way. Like you, you see the Premier League, you see the Championship in England, Scotland, the average tenure of managers. Like, Arnie's been at Larg for a number of years, knows how to get the best at the boys that he's got, knows the best of his football club. Bucker, you know, um, Moff's been in there a few years now. Dan Hurlford, you know, these guys know the league, they know the players, they, they get the best at the guys, and that's why the league's so competitive. Um, we've known, you know, you get to know each other, you get to know how people play, how they want to play, but these guys are competitors, they're, they're, they're real, you know, managers who want to be successful, and they'll push their players as, as, as best they can. There is a disparity in money. People talk about money all the time, and it, it kind of bugs me, like, you can only spend, you can only spend what you've got, and, Ultimately, you can put 11 players in the park. You maybe can have a bit of strength and depth in terms of your bench, but if you're sitting with two or three thousand pounds in the bench, these boys, you know, it's hard to keep everybody happy as well. You, you've, you've got a, a nucleus of a team, and if you've got some good young boys that you can bring in and everybody's hungry, then it doesn't matter how much money you've got. I, I, we'd all like more money, but I've had more money than I've had this year, probably maybe in a couple of seasons at Conan. Didn't guarantee success. Didn't yeah. guarantee success in any way, shape, or form. So there's good, good managers. There's good teams. Um, there's good players fundamentally. And and what I would say is, as the teams get more ambitious and more progressive, the good players get spread out, probably more across the teams. If you know what I mean. Um, you, you used to maybe go all oh, the top four or five teams. Their their players are you know head and shoulders better than the rest. Boys now have had a good upbringing, a good technical upbringing with regards to they get into pro youth setups at a very early age, and you find that they've got a good coat, they've got a good technical background. What we're trying to do is probably teach them a wee bit more about the winning aspect of the game as opposed to development in football, and that kind of comes round. You see character, and character's the big thing, character's the differential. Um, it, it always will be your behaviours and your fundamentals week in, week out. Can you be as strong as you were last week? Can you be better? Can you try and push yourself? And and there's, as it, you, you really, you know, speak about the teams that maybe fly under the radar, but um, you've, you've got Cumnut and uh, Glen Cairn, you know, they've not had good seasons in the league that they're in. If you look at where they are, they're, they're contesting the, the cup final next week, you know. Yeah. So, it doesn't matter who you are. You can have elements of success if you work hard across the board. And I know, I mean, John's in, in a very, very tough league. He's right. I've, I've been in about four or five games. Uh, Gavin Field's obviously a very good friend of mine. Yeah. And I've, I've been and watched the Winton a few times. And I thought the standard in the league is really, really good. There's no a lot of disparity between the standard. If you're considering they're in the third league, there's three tiers between, you know, um, that, that league that they're in. And Winton beat us in a friendly, you know, um, and deserve to beat us on the night in a, in a friendly show. There's good players right across the board at a level. It doesn't mean to say because you're not playing with a top team, there's no good players out there. Um, but the Premier League is by far, that this is the hardest it's been in terms of teams being able to yeah. you know, play against each other week in, week out. You find that there's bogey teams out there. Um, Hurlford beat us twice this season. Um, they, they, they hammered us at home. Um and they beat us at the last game of the season. Um, and I think that's the only team that we've not really had any joy against. Well, Brian McGinty will tell you that we didn't manage to beat Cumnock. We drew with them twice, but he's, he stole two draws against us, and as I remind them all the time. And obviously the, the other entry, you know, like you, the one team that stands out is obviously Cole winning. And we, it's, I think it's really hard to, to put your finger on where what went wrong with Cole winning, because obviously they are a managerial change at the start of the season with David Yana and then obviously David losing his job and uh, Chris Aitken getting in. There's a lot of... It's really difficult to put your finger on. Obviously, you'll you'll know the situation better than a lot of people. How are you, How surprised are you that the way Cole won? Because I never asked at the start of the season if you'd said to me who Cole won and are going to get relegated. I thought you were crazy. Just that the players were signing and that. I, I just find it really, really weird how far Cole won and fell this season. Yeah, it's a tough one for me to answer, to be honest. Yeah. But probably I, I would like to plead the fifth on it because <laughs> it's not for me. You know, I had a, had a really good time at Cohen and I kept him in the league for a, the longest prolonged period in their history and I thought we were doing some good stuff at Cohen. The board of directors wanted to go, or the, the, the committee wanted to go in a different direction. Um, and I've seen comments that um, I wouldn't have been able to do with Cohen and what I did. 
it, it, it's not about me. It really is. The, the, the team that I've inherited and the players that we added and it be, have been the success story for me. But it's it's very difficult when you look at co-winning. They've still got very good players. The, the players that were there when I was there are all still good players. But when you, just like we said with us, when you pick up winning habits, you know, it, it tends to kind of create a momentum and the same is true when you're not winning games. You start to question yourself without your... Um, Ability. I went to a few winning games again because my wife doesn't like me in the house, so I go to a lot of football. So um, I went to a few winning games because it suited me and it was local. And I went to a couple of games where I thought they were very good. And I went to a couple of games where I, I probably couldn't believe what I was seeing in terms of the goals that they were giving away and stuff like that. But they had a tough time with injuries and just one of these seasons where, kind of for us, everything went for us and everything for them didn't go so well. But Again, I've got real umbrage just to me being removed from there, given what I felt I gave the club. So it's not really a fair question to ask um, what I think is wrong, because I could tell you probably, but it's it then becomes a wee bit personal and I don't kind of want to get into that. Yeah, I can imagine. We'll, we'll move on to the first division, John. Obviously, there wasn't yeah. a lot to play for over the weekend. The the one thing that obviously Garkian did secure the title, they won... Uh, they drew 1-1 with Ben Barb. Obviously, St. Caddox had their best in 1-6-1, but Gartkian won the league by a point. Gartkian, St. Caddox, Ben Barb go up, and there are three teams that can be taken really seriously in the Premier Division next season. No, definitely. I mean, also, I was in that league until March this year, or well, sorry, February this year. Um, it, it's a strong league. It was a funny league. There was, there was a lot of different um, teams were moving up and down the league. You know, you, you had Ben Barb, who were bottom. Yeah, you know, bought them for a for a spell. Then on a run of winning five games, it shot them right up into like fourth and third, and they just kept moving. You know, Coburnley obviously dropped down. Um, Coburnley were kind of up and down again. You know, this season in terms of that, you look at Blantyre. Blantyre were down round about the bottom, but they've finished fifth. So I mean, Gibby's done an absolutely tremendous job there. Um, you know, Jamie with Johnston Borough as well. You know, sitting seventh at the end of it. You know, Neilston sitting eighth. You know, some so so some teams that you'd have thought would have maybe been at the start of the season, maybe a couple of places further down. You know, if it if it had great seasons, the drum will obviously be very disappointed because you know they were looking to get up this year and just you know narrowly narrowly uh, you know didn't make it. You know, four points at the end. I think they'll probably look back on it. You know, some some drop points at home and and not really getting over the line. Um, whereas Ben Bub, St Caddox and uh, Gart Cairn all going up I means. Chris says, Gart Cairn, you know, good club, you know, well ran. They've got the, the, the full youth set up there who who will help that uh, in terms of, you know, what Mick's going to do there. Um, and I'm sure they'll be strong. St Caddox, obviously under the new management team, uh, uh, Martin Fellows, I know Fez, um, I had his younger uh, brother uh, this season at Cumbernauld, um, who went on to play with Bember. But, you know, he's going in there and it's going to be pretty much a whole new team. I see they've, they've, they've put a few players up for sale tonight. Um, as well so again big changes there and you know how that works you know only, only we'll, we'll find out next season but you know there's wholesale changes at that club Gart Cairn I'm sure Mick will bring in you know a, a number of players to supplement what he's what he's got and what he wants to keep but you know three strong teams I mean Burb, last season I think we they beat us 3-2 after it's been 2-1 up and we, we beat them at home Um but, you know, Bember team never, ever stops. You know, they're very direct in their play, but they've got some real quality, especially in the forward areas, um, you know. So I think the, um, those three going up will make it an even more interesting league uh, next year for, for Chris and all the rest of the teams in there. It certainly will. And Chris, the one thing that stands out, obviously, this season was just how many good teams are were in it. And it, it shows you just how solid a lot of teams have, like, Jim Chapel, Coburnley are obviously going to have a new management team. Johnson Barra have brought in two top class midfielders for, for that league. And I think it's going to be more of the same next season. I think you give a lot of solid sides in there going for promotion. Yeah, I, I think it, I can allude to it earlier. It's the ambition of the football clubs now. You know, it, people talk about the pyramid in terms of there is a bottleneck towards the, the loan league and obviously getting into the SPFL. But clubs want to push themselves as much as they possibly can. They want to get as high as they possibly can. And managers 
players, you know, everybody's got ambitions to play at the, the best level that they possibly can. Um, I, I, I look at that league next year and I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's a real tough league. You could throw a blanket over five or six teams and think, you know, it's going to be a scrap for promotion again. But similarly, at the bottom end, is again, what I was talking about, there's a levelling out of um, the teams that maybe had a great season when the conferences were there and they've maybe not got that ambition to kick on and go further again and they'll, you know, find their way back into what was maybe known as the district leagues mm-hmm. kind of a certain period in time. Um, but fiercely ambitious clubs like Vela Clyde, Winton, that are going into that league that want to push on and get a championship and, get, you know, see if they can get to the Premier League. That, that's what it's about. It's about, you know... The committees, the clubs, you, you alluded to the fact that, you know, Vela Clyde have got a great wee support there. You know, supporters want his success. You know, they'll be there when they're winning. Um, and, and the nature of the beast is that when you're not winning, then the, the crowds drop off and stuff like that. So everybody wants that wee bit of success and that slice of success. And that league will be a real, real burst up next year, as will the league above. And, and, and I think you're starting to see now that teams are finding the level and, and when they get to that level, it becomes a real scrap to, to stay there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and John, towards the kind of bottom, obviously Cumbernauld, uh, your, your ex-team obviously relegated as well. Bonneton, I think Bonneton as well are an our team that deserve a lot of credit to even be in the kind of position where it went to the final day for them. I think it's a marvellous achievement for Ross. Ross Vale are going to go under a, a transition in every sense next season. So, can I, those three sides like that like Cumbernauld obviously I'm I'm kind of your thoughts on Jamie and Chris going uh, what going in there and they obviously couldn't manage to say to to save them their first division spot but the three sides who could just as easily go straight back yeah, up yeah no yeah no definitely I mean I think you were talking about Bonington there Ross you know did a great job there and they were sitting mid table but they played a lot of games and teams mm-hmm. are catching up and they were always they would be sitting there going you know hope a couple of these teams lose and we kind of stay in the league. Um, Cumbernauld, you know, a great club. I spent, you know, just under two years there um, prior to um, Tony, myself and Chris leaving. Um, but a great club and I'm sure they'll bounce back. I mean, Jamie and Chris are, are, are two, you know, a, a great management team. So they've been over the course before in previous division and, and got promotion, etc. So I'm sure, um, you know, especially George at Cumbernauld, he'll be, he'll be desperate to get the club, you know, back up, um, up the leagues and, I'm sure it'll be, you know, with, with him and Jamie and uh, Chris, they'll, they'll certainly be doing that. Obviously, Rose Vale, I know Kevin uh, Kelly really well. I've known him since he's been a kid, uh, close to his dad. So, um, Kevin will be certainly looking to, to progress um, them again next year to get promotion. I've had some conversations with him over the last few weeks and um, they are actively um, working well to, 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 to get the squad right for next season. So, you know that league that we'll be in will certainly be be competitive. And as Chris was saying, and I think, you know, folk can say what they want about, you know, the, the pyramid and, you know, the West of Scotland League and if it's good or for bad. But I would certainly say over the last, you know, three, four years, not just from the top team, but right across the whole three divisions, four divisions, you can see the improvements that teams are making to their facilities, their pitches, their whole kind of infrastructure around the places. So, you know, it's, it's certainly, for me, uh, it certainly improved um, the, the kind of look and feel of what was deemed the old junior uh, type football. It certainly, I think, moved way away from that um, in terms of what the clubs are trying to do. Um, it, you know, on on all fronts. You know, we we are trying to push this. You know, over the summer, we're extending facilities in terms of spectator uh, space within the the clubhouse and all that. So, you know, um, all clubs are working hard and. I think, um, as Chris said, all divisions, there's, there's players there that could play, you know, in the top league, you know, first division, championship, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's certainly quality um, throughout, throughout the league. Chris, second division, Renfrew, Ashfield and Maybowl will be going up. There's a lot of sides in there that I think deserve a lot of credit. Renfrew obviously won the league. I've been very impressed with him this season, scoring a lot of goals. Ashfield as well, really good. So again, just a, a kind of summer thing. A lot of sides that are are, go, are going to look to kick on again next season. Yeah, Jimmy uh, Quigley done a great job there. Um, somebody again who's been in and around the club for a long, long time. Um, you know they they suffered a couple of relegations when they moved from Western Park to the new Western Park, and they, they've got their set up there going well. Boy Divers scored a lot of goals for them as well. Um, 
So, Brentford are a good addition to the league above, certainly with facilities and, and the way they want to play. Um, they've got, uh, I think you said there, it was Ashfield and Mabel that came up behind them. Um, Ashfield, again, you've got people work tirelessly in the background. They're no big match who works in the background there to make sure that the whole club is run for the community um, and, and to get that wee bit of success. Again, shows that they're coming back on the, the, the track. And I mean, you know, the area that they're in is a very competitive area for players. They've got Persia in there about there. They've got um, Peter Hill, you know, good, you know, Glasgow clubs that are bit steeped in history. And, and they'll relish the fact that they're coming back up again and, and look to kick on. They've got some good players in there as well, um, scoring goals and stuff like that uh, all the time. Anytime you see Ashfield, you know, they're a very forward, progressive thinking football playing team. Um, I went to see Mabel um, actually last week um, and, and you know, they they got promotion quite comfortably, Mabel. But Mabel's probably a team where, if I look at them, they're full of experienced players. Yeah. Um, you know, they've got a sprinkling of youth. But Carlo's been there forever. And, and the, you know, there's a, a consistent pattern that I'm you know, speaking about. These guys that do the best for their clubs, that are in situ for a long time, have maybe been given plans and place that are not just, you know, flash in the pan type scenarios. Jimmy went in there, you know, after a couple of relegations and it's took him maybe a year, two years to bring through some of the young, exciting kids that he wanted to bring through and went through reaping their rewards for sticking to their plan. And that's what you've got to do because they're bumps in the road. That resilience is the thing that keeps you going as a manager. You sometimes wonder why you're doing it because there's more down days than there is up days in terms of there's only one team that can win the league. There's only, you know, there's only so many cups that you can go and win and you know you have a lot of days where you question why am I doing this but um, it's the love of the game for the managers probably at their level you know it's, we're not doing this for financial rewards certainly um, and, and again you do get rewarded when you push boys on and you can see them going better yourself there's absolutely no doubt that's a rewarding part of the job but there are some tough times and you deserve that wee bit of break I think if you've done it for as long and weary as some of the guys have and, and it's, it's good to see that clubs are, you know, they don't look at the telly as much, I suppose, and look at, you know, board of directors giving, you know, like the boy Potter six to eighty days and some of the players don't fancy him and then they go, you know what, it's easier to get rid of him than it is to get rid of 12, 14 players. So, um, it's a different piece, but I think it's a good one. And, and, and again, that division, my son played in that league with Ardeer. They, they were unlucky to go down in, in the end. Um, but, Teams like Mary Hill, you know, young manager in there. Um, and again, they're striving to get themselves back in the map. And some good traditional old junior clubs that are in that league that you think, hmm, if they get things right, they could be on the up again. But they need to get things right. And this is where the pyramid's good because you've got clubs like Fanart, West Park, you know, new clubs that have come in who think, do you know what? we can really upset the apple cart here. And if the old traditional clubs don't get their finger out, they'll be left behind. And that's where that competition breeds competition. And and, and I think the, the, the lower leagues, we took Scott Roth from Muir Cup. Yeah. Um, Scott was at Benburg 20s before that. And when I look at, you know, Scott coming into us, I've took a chance in Scott. And, and, and again, I'll, I'll kind of probably give uh, Big Derek Wingate um, and my dad... A kind of, what did I say? A bit of praise. I'm not really good for praising my, my father right enough, but um, I sent him to watch Muir Cup because Dexy told me about the boys and I didn't tell him who I, I wanted him to go and see. And he came back and he said, Oh, there's a big boy play centre half for me, Bill. Yeah, for Muir Cup, sorry. He said, He might not be the finished article right now, but he's got everything you would want in terms of he's a good talker. Uh, he's aggressive, you know, he wants the ball at times. He says he's maybe a bit raw. And I'm like, you know, uh, and John will, John will agree with me here. Centre half are like hen's teeth now, like in terms of trying to find somebody who you can go and build your, your spine of your team from. And I thought, you know what, it's just worth a chance. And fortunately, um, his manager, you know, agreed that the step up, you know, would, would be good for him. But we paid good money to get him out of that league and it was a, a real gamble because he had never played in the top league but you can see with him at a Man of the Match awards and how he played for us at the season and it just goes to kind of reinforce what John was saying and what I'm trying to say. There's good players at that level 
they just need an opportunity and some of them are maybe more professional and dedicated to the game than other ones um, and they'll you know come to the fore but as I, as I looked at with Mabel you've got guys there like Mick McCann who's went and scored yeah. you know 20, 25 goals Mick you know Mick will be banging on 40 but still got the love for the game and again coming from a difficult time when he was manager of Glad Afton it's dead easy to think oh I'm done with football but he's there for the love of the game and he's got his rewards and, and a promotion at that age and I'm sure he want to kick on again Yeah absolutely uh, Third division John there's a Obviously, it was very tight in the promotion. Obviously, Adrosson managed to get the third spot with a point. Irvin Vax, Les Mahego, Lanner called within three points. Again, it was it was really tight. I was every week we were talking on here. There was a, it was the places would change every single week. There's a lot of sides in there that are again just maybe get a one or two players in, maybe just strengthen and, and they'll be able to have a right good go next season. No, definitely. It's got. I think I said earlier. I think the the places for the top seven are definitely. Reflective in what I seen from the teams, you know, Lark Cole, I said, were, were excellent, you know, against us up there. Our Drossen, uh, we did turn them over down there. Um, Irvin Vicks, we beat at home. Les Mahego, again, that was my first game in charge. Lanark, all, you know, Les Mahego, you know, will find themselves very unlucky not to, not to get into the top three because I mean, they won a number, a number of games, you know, probably won the last seven or eight games near the end of the season. Irvin Vicks, again, only dropped out. By, be one point, you know, Lanark, I'm sure they'll want to go again under Simon. Um, below that, as Chris said, Fanart, you know, they, they're a progressive club. You know, I know Big Brian, he'll be trying to push them, you know, again, um, you know, higher up that league. You've got teams coming into there, West Park, etc. Again, progressive clubs, you know, we, 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 we good, you know, teams behind them to, to progress through. So, again, I think that, that will be a, a, certainly a, a tough league. Um, next year, but I think if if Irvin Vix and Les Mahego and your Lanarks, even Bells Hill, I mean Bells Hill had yeah. a, an excellent end to the season, excellent end to the season, um, and they've got they've got a good wee set up there as well, you know, up 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 at Bells Hill. So, um, again, they'll be pushing my big pal Chris at Dorai. He'll be looking to, you know, obviously they they, they just uh, escaped um, relegation, um, you know, in the last few games, but he, you know, he's a winner and he'll want to push them. You know, up those leaps and and a very young people know do I. You know, he's done really, really well to keep that bunch of players together. And if he keeps them together again, I think they could, you know, start to play good football. And I, again, I've watched a lot of games in your league because of Gavin and different things. But the, the level of football, which back to what you said, there, John, it's no pick and rush. Just get wired in. You know, teams are trying to play. They're trying to do the right things. And again. But it's a lack of probably experience in some of the teams at the lower end. But if they can yeah. stick together and gather that experience, really, think, really good. good I, think that's, I think that's right, Chris. Been, you know, a few players I've been speaking to, you know, they've been watching our highlights. They've been obviously doing a wee bit of homework, you know, and I know some of the players and, you know, no disrespect to, you know, they could be playing, some of them could be playing, you know, in, in the Premier or most certainly, definitely the first. So I'm trying to entice, you know, I've enticed two or three of them uh, and they've basically said, you know, we've watched the football, as you said, and it's not a lot, a lot of it's not kick and rush and, you know, you try and get the ball down and you try to play when you when you, you can. Obviously, there's times where you just, you know, you need to be a bit more direct and, and, and force the game, but um, a lot of the a lot of the teams in our league certainly play, you know, really good football. I think our Drossens pitch suited us that day, you know, it was, you know, it was a fantastic condition and it was a great day and, you know, our players just, you know, lap it up in terms of how, how we could play on it. Fourth division, the, the three that went up were West Park United, Go South Athletic and Three Rovers. Chris, a lot of chat at the start of the season about those three teams, obviously for different reasons. West Park, obviously, really good season. Go South, obviously, young manager is doing really well. Three have taken the chance to come to the West. And I think the three sides, again, who could be taken very seriously going forward. Yeah. Listen, it's takes takes character it takes you know good teams to win any league you know you don't win a league by flip and you know West Park by all accounts you know we're, we're going to play them in a friendly at the start of the season as well and um, they, they look to play football you know a couple of players within their team that are real standouts and yeah. you've got you know guys like Eddie come back down and playing there as well and stuff like that so well, I think again the, the thing that stands out is they thrive in their community and that, that they're from that area. They want to do well for that area. And kind of what you were saying earlier, John, with regards to boys who are friends ending up playing 
you know, weigh each other, just what happens they might be good at football. So um, that these teams are, as I say, and I, I want to repeat myself, it, if the clubs don't look out for these clubs coming and match their ambition and match their desire, then you can be left behind pretty quickly. Um, I think they've, you know, a South of Scotland team coming into traditionally a traditional South of Scotland team coming into a West setup. Everybody was intrigued to see how they would handle the travelling, whether the players' commitments there over the course of a full season. Absolutely fantastic for them. And they've got a lovely wee ground. I played down there when I played with Community South. It's a lovely wee ground and um I think they will enhance the league. And you know, there's a newness and a freshness about it when you're playing new teams and you don't know what to expect. You know, you try to do your homework and everybody and give everybody due respect, but there's always that surprise element for, for people. And I think some of these teams coming up, I don't know an awful lot about Kilsyth, obviously. It's a second team within a town. Um, I don't know what their you know, background in terms of their catchment and how they get their players and stuff like that. But you, you were right, they've got a good young manager who is, is determined to show his credentials from a coaching perspective. And um, when you've got that hunger and that desire in the background, then you know, your team stands in good stead. And I think they've 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 kept um, pretty much the nucleus of the squad cool side yeah. for next season. So um it looks like they'll be strong again. Yeah, absolutely. And John, there's obviously like going into next season, I think I, I am under the impression that one club's going to be joining from the, the amateur setup. I don't know exactly about one yet, but I'm under the impression there's gonna be one joining. But you're also like next season, like St Peter's and Thorn, kind of two sides that stood out last season. Rossville, I think, will be a team to keep an eye on once they, because they'll be on our side. Obviously, Josh Gardner's going in there. I think there's going to be a lot of transition there. Eglinton, Chris, as well. We, we've seen just the, the kind of journey they've been on this year. There's a lot of sides to, to take seriously. And you've obviously got a lot of sides coming down as well who will be desperate to get straight back up. And I'm thinking like Luger, East Kilbride, Thistle, two sides that I wouldn't have thought would have been where they are. But that that league could be really competitive next season, actually. Yeah, um, big George is it? Look, I know George is kind of jumped into the amateur setup in there. I, I, I've just kind of you look at it and the seven teams that are, is it six teams that went down to that league? Yeah. It's an awful lot in any season, and we had it obviously last year with the conferences. It, it, you can have a decent season and end up getting relegated, which I don't think is fair. You, you look to the scenario where Benburb got relegated last year for our league, which they were, you know, celebrating staying up at one point and lost out in goal difference. It, it's no fair to relegate, you know, six teams, but there's an even and out, as we said, and these clubs might take stock. You know, there's been a, a difficult journey for a few of these clubs over the period of time and you, you look at maybe clubs like Solcoach and things like that who are no locally for us put a lot of effort in yeah. Eglinton just starting up trying to give boys in the town who and again this is where there's a bit of disparity between under 20 football and, and amateur football um, I'm always somebody who says didn't matter their age, get them into the the, the, the men's set up as soon as you can and you'll develop them, you'll develop their character. I've seen a lot of 20s games on Friday nights um, and yeah, well, you're technically gifted now, you know, but the game is without a doubt a development game and then there's a, maybe a lack of discipline in the game. I've seen some of the tackles and you're going like, wow, you know, you wouldn't get away with that. There would be a hairy man, you know, telling you, you can't get away with that. So, you know, keep your discipline, sort yourself out and, they learn. Everybody makes mistakes, but that's where you learn. But you don't learn if you're doing the same things we could in the same peer group and you're not being challenged. And that's where amateur footballs really struggle with they can uptake a twenties and, and, and nineteens. And I was all for the twenties at, at our kind of age group because I think it was going to be a good thing for to try and bleed players. But this is what I'm alluding to with the clubs at the at the back end and amateur teams for that matter. That the jump from the kids for the 20s to the Premier League and the First Division is too much. Yeah. Um, it's too much physically and it's too much mentally. They, they can be bled into it and, and you'll see the good players that will be, you know, do well initially. Then they have that wee lull where the adrenaline's not quite there and they maybe need to take them back out and a period of time to build their self up, build their confidence, build their physique and then you go again and then they'll remember the mistakes that they made and they'll be better for that. They're in the Premier League, as, as I kind of said to you just now, it's so cutthroat that everybody wants to stay there and, and it, 
I, I even seen it with Cowinning, you know, a couple of young boys get bled at Cowinning because of injuries and because they weren't maybe doing so well at the back. Um, young goalkeeper Ewan Henderson's a very young, good young goalkeeper, but made a couple of bloopers where he knew he should do better himself and he probably could have done me getting taken out at that time, but couldn't he? But this is where if they're doing really well and they're playing with men and, and learning good behaviours at the bottom end of the divisions, they'll come up and you always find your level. But I think it's taking too long for boys to find their level. You know, um, I'm looking at my own son who's 19 just now. Um, he went and played with our dear and he'll, let, he'll take a lot for the season. It didn't go as well as he wanted it to go, but he'll take a lot for that season and he'll learn to that and he'll, you know, use it as a driver to kick on. Or he'll end up, you know, playing at that level forever. And I think merit is a big thing that you, we, we miss out. I think there's a, a sense of entitlement that boys maybe feel attracted to a tracksuit and think, well, oh, I play with this team and, you know, I'm with them. I think it was a, a couple of years ago, Brendan Rodgers was speaking about Celtic and he said, you don't play with the team. You're affiliated to the team. Until you're in the team, you're not a, a Celtic player. And I think yeah. that a lot with the, with the boys go and play go and play where you can play to better yourself and then you'll find where you get to and you're just kind of footballing journey and I think a lot of the teams at the bottom end are trying to provide the facilities for them to do that I think you're spot on Chris just what you said there I think my experience over the last I don't know, eight, nine, ten years when trying to bring boys in from the old 21s it took them at least six months you know at least six months to just acclimatise to the demands of as you say being in a dress room with a hairy ass you know if the year old, you know, putting certain demands on them kind of thing. And, it, it, you know, it takes them that time to just kind of get used to it. I mean, some, don't get me wrong, some do come right in. Um, but in my experience, having a couple that, you know, after the Christmas period, I've just said, right, you're going to play the next eight games. And some have got moves, you know, to Irvine Meadow and places like that because it's taken that time and, and we've bedded them in kind of in the right way. But, uh, no, I think, I think you're spot on in what you said there. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what you both said. It's been a, it's been brilliant to to kind of get that insight and to kind of look at the season. It's been a, a real pleasure to do the show, and I really want to thank you both for for joining me tonight's season review, Chris. First of all, thank you very much, and congratulations on your your title win. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much, and John as well. Thank you very much for coming on. Congratulations and best of luck for uh, promotion next season. No, thanks a lot, Scott, and congratulations right. again, Chris. Cheers. Yeah, you too, John. Well done for you, Scott. I've been keeping an eye out on this over the course of the season. It's not an easy job all the time trying to um, find stories and keep everybody interested. But the promotion air level of football is something that you know we appreciate because, as I say, it's yes. not easy sometimes. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much to everyone that's been a guest over the season as well and everyone that's tuned in. Thanks very much for that. And we'll see you all next season. Enjoy your summer and we'll be back soon. Cheers. Thank you.